welcome to everybody who's attending. Um, it's so good to see you here. We've still got attendees rolling in here. So, um, so this is fantastic. Um, so I want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time on front matter because we're going to aim for an end time, probably 2.30 is ideal, that one hour kind of talk tends to be sort of the sweet spot. However, if there are extra questions, we might be able to go up to 15 minutes um, longer. Um, I, I want to just kind of set the scene though and say, you know, the, the eradication of poverty and economic and social challenges around the world requires the economic and social empowerment of women. Um, however, in much of the world, and that's true here, and it's true in East Africa, where these women are from, um, girls tend to face much bigger challenges that as compared as compared to their brothers. And as such, many of the women who desire good jobs are not in a position to obtain them without additional job training and mentoring opportunities and ways to connect them to the, the world of economic and social empowerment. And so I'm so excited to bring these amazing women together who I have learned through in my work on the I'm Her.net project with my students, which is about global menstrual hygiene and which is very much connected to economic and social education and opportunity. Um, and many of these women, some of these women have been to Dartmouth before and inspired our students. Um, and we just, I love this partnership. It's so great. And it's so much of it's due to the Dickey Center being able to bring these incredible people together to learn about female empowerment here and around the world. Um, so I think the Dickey Center and the acting director of that, um, Chris Wolforth and the amazing staff there that makes it um, all happen. Um, and, and we're so appreciative of that. Um, I'm Deborah Jordan Brooks. I'm a professor of American politics at Dartmouth College. Um, in addition to my down and dirty classes on the sausage factory that is current American politics right now, um, I'm also teaching a really exciting yeah, class, really class, class on women and leadership. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome my GUP20 students here today, both the ones in my class now and also from past quarters who've seen some of these speakers in those classes before. Um, and welcome to all the, the Dartmouth students and community and people um, globally. Um, I, I want to say, you know, there's job training for women and mentorship is a really important issue because it's easy to oversimplify it. Um, there's the parable, give a man a fish and he'll eat today, but teach a man to fish and he'll eat forever. Sounds simple. Sounds easy to implement, um, but it's not entirely true. As with many things, it's far more complicated than that. Um, you need to be able to replace the fishing pole. You need to be able to get a fishing pole to start with. Um, you need to have a system for that. If you trade everybody in the village to fish, um, there's gonna be too many people fishing and that's gonna cause its own problems and there's not gonna be a market so that person can support their family. Um, if you bring in somebody from another country who's an expert in fishing in their country, Country, and then um, have them do the instruction. Well, they might have to teach the local people how to fish the wrong way and so on and so forth. And it's very different for women as well, right? That man you teach how to fish doesn't have to figure out how to arrange for childcare. He doesn't have to, he may have been more likely to receive, you know, mentorship or education along the way in his community than women. And he also doesn't probably have to get permission from anybody to do it and to try to support himself doing it, whereas women do, right? So once you start unraveling this, it's, it's almost deliciously complicated and be really easy to kind of give up and decide, this is too complicated. But these women didn't give up. They got in there, deal with the complexities on a daily basis. And I had the opportunity to see two of these projects in action um, on a trip in January to um, Uganda and Rwanda. And just the, the number of challenges they're dealing with you know, in creative ways is just astounding. And they are creating solutions. They didn't give up when it was complicated. They made it happen and they're learning every day and they're sharing that learning um, in many different ways, this included. Um, so 
Um, I'm so excited to introduce these speakers to you. We've got um, Rema Kosuli. Um, she spent a lot of time at Dartmouth over the years um, in different ways, and she describes herself as a serial entrepreneur. She is a project focused on young women who have graduated from college and are moving beyond that. I'm gonna have her introduce herself and her work um, last. Um, and then Jamila, Jamila um, Mahiyana is in Uganda as well. She's a former Dartmouth Yali scholar, so has had a lot of connections to the Dickey Center over the years. I know her through her work on Smart Girls Uganda, um, where she does a lot of menstrual hygiene work and distributes these super cute and cool and functional um, menstrual hygiene backpacks um, to girls who need them. But she's also got a Girls with Tools initiative um, focusing on helping lower income women um, enter mostly male trades that are fairly lucrative in Uganda. She'll be speaking, introducing herself second. And then Antoinette Umana is um, um, the Rwandan country director for Women to Women International, which is a large global NGO that happens to be headed by a Dartmouth alumni, Lori Adams, class of 1989. So it could be many of you in this audience someday. Um, and she, in this organization, trains women around the world um, in, in crafts and various trades, um, providing life skills training and mentoring along the way. And um, and they're interesting because they're operating in many different countries, but I got to see um, the work that Antoinette and her impressive team of Women to, for Women International Rwanda folks um, implementing um, that work in that country. So that was really exciting. So very different organizations um, doing amazing things in different ways. And so um, I'm gonna have Antoinette lead us off. I have some pictures to kind of give you a visual look um, at the kind of work they're doing, which I'm gonna show some of while she talk, while she introduces herself and we'll have questions after that. Thank you, Antoinette, for being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Deb. That's really very nice. And thank you for giving um, this opportunity to talk in this great um, uh, platform. Uh, and also thank you for your visit and your daughter and your friend in Rwanda. It was really amazing to see your team. We are very grateful. So thank you. Amazing. As uh, Deb just explained, I'm the country director for Women for Women International, the country office in Rwanda uh, six, since six years and a half now. So um, our program, the Women for Women International program in Rwanda is um, uh, provided in all the countries where Women for Women is working in is it provides skills training for basically 12 months to each of the women who enter the program. So the mission of the organization is to support uh, women in, in, in post-conflict countries uh, because of the issues and the importance of really uh, helping the women because they are the most affected, but also uh, they are the one to rebuild the country. We know the importance of the role of the women to rebuild the economies in, in, in con uh, conflict countries. So the group or the women that we select are very vulnerable because of conflict and they are in very level, high level of poverty. They are affected by uh, GBV. They are earning very little income. And the, the, the program is built in a way that provides a combination of life skills, business skills, and vocational skills. So it, it really gives a package to a woman to build herself efficacy, to build the confidence, at the same time gaining like uh, basic skills in businesses to be able to manage a small, later bigger, but uh, starting by a small income generating activity and give her also a profession. That's how it, it, it's really uh, built that, that the basic for the program. So through the years, we are now 23 years in Rwanda. Um, we are covering 11 districts out of 30 in the country. So we have really grown over the years, but we have also evolved in terms of programming. Uh, originally, we have this program plus cash transfers monthly to the woman. But now we have uh, integrated village savings uh, and loans associations. 
which are now part of the program. We have included uh, men engaged program. So we are engaging also men uh, for gender equality and we provide them uh, some also skill for, to support women. Uh, we have also improved the vocational skills over the years to really respond to the needs of the market. So um, yeah, in summary, that's how I could say, and then we can go through uh, our program uh, while uh, maybe after when we explain uh, uh, if there are any questions, but that's the, the core training that uh, Women for Women provide. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for speaking and um, I appreciate that. And I will add to the incredible mix of things that they do um, that um, they also do an incredible, they have an ecotourism um, center that I was able to visit with my family and another Yali Mandela scholar from Burundi, a uh, dear friend Grace. And we were able to stay there and see the women doing their work. It's an active training center, but it's also just great tourism, beautiful kind of safari like setting an hour from a safari park. Everyone should check that out. And I'm kind of bullish on that idea of mixing kind of cultural tourism opportunities with um, with this kind of training and social good opportunity. It was just a win-win all around. I could not have been more impressed by that, but that's just a tiny part of what they do. Um, mm -hmm. And so thank you. And I look forward to hearing more about it. We've got lots of questions. Um, and so let's have Jamila kind of introduce us to the amazing work that Smart Girls Uganda does and especially the Girls with Tools initiative. And I'm going to, um, let's see, how do I resume the share? Okay, sorry, here we go. Um, oh. let's see. Thank you, Deb. Um, thank you so much for having us. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jamila Mayanja. I'm the founder and team lead of Smart Girls Foundation Uganda, and also a Yali alumni for 2015 as a Dartmouth for the business track. Um, we, I, at Smart Girls, we empower girls and women, uh, mostly between the ages of nine to 40, and we try and keep empower them to have a healthy lifestyle and live an economically sustainable lifestyle. One of our biggest programs we do for the young girls is um, we have one called the Smart Bags for Girls. Um, this is a, a, a bag I innovated after giving out a number of use, reusable pads, and I still couldn't solve the issue of having the girls stay out of school because of their messes. And the main reason was because the girls, when they get to school, they do not have privacy in using these reusable pads. So I innovated that smart bag to have a where, which has a compartment where the girls put their unused reusable pads. And when they get school and they don't have time to, to wash or um, wash their pads, they can actually keep the used and used reusable pad there so they can confidently go back to go back home and stay in school. We are now even using design thinking. We've been able to upgrade it now. We are doing a, a solar recycled smart bag so that it can also, it's waterproof, but also light them when they get back home because most of the girls after housework, they don't have time to read their books um, because of load shedding that is even going on right now in Kampala. So the solar really helps them to read their books. So a very good um, innovation that keeps the girls in school during their menses, but also make sure it lights them to, to also study. Um, we have um, our other program, um, that is called the Girls with Tools program, where we train young women who are survivors of, um, of gender-based violence, who are school dropouts, who are teenage mothers. It's more of like a second, second chance education um, where we, we empower them in male-dominated careers, that is mechanics, welding, carpentry, construct, construct, construction, sorry, um, house painting, um, Cup welding. So these are careers in Uganda that are basically perceived to be for male. And we take these ladies for six months. We, we skill them real hands-on and after group them in teams of 10 so that they can go up, go and um, create their own um, 
businesses. Um, as you can see there, that we make sure they also get the experience of having graduated from this skilling because most of them are young mothers who did not have a chance to finish school and now they are excited to have something that can economically sustain them. And after the, when they launch their workshops, we take them to our business girl magic and um, make sure we follow them up for a year that their businesses are running for a very good time. They're sustainable and they're hiring more ladies and skilling more ladies to keep on working in these male dominated, these male dominated skills. Yeah. And of course, that is the coffee talk we do under the business girl magic to help them network with um, fellow ladies to make sure they, are, they feel included with a corporate because um, most of these young ladies think since they are coming from backgrounds where they didn't finish school, they are, they are um, former sex workers, um, they don't feel welcome to be part of a corporate society. So we do coffee talks in partnership with the US Embassy to try and get them understand and um, network and collaborate with other young ladies who have other businesses, maybe in agribusiness, business so that they can have that co-working space among, among themselves. Yeah, so that happens every, every quarter. We have a coffee talk so that we can network with them. Yeah. Jamila, Thank you, Deb. Other questions will come through as I explain other. Just to clarify, um, this is a picture of, um, what, what is this a picture of? Is this one of the businesses that you've cultivated? Or she's super stylish. Like you can tell the girls with tools, uniforms are super cute. The backpacks are cute. Is that, what's this? So that, um, we, under the Girls with Tools, we have some programs. Um, we have the tailoring program um, for the ladies who absolutely don't want to take up the male dominated skills. And these are ladies also who are still young mothers. And um, the lady there, the bags that we make for the girls in the smart bags are actually made for are made by our women in the tailoring in the tailoring class. So that, that's the beauty about the smart bags. The smart bags are made by women for the girls. Um, the same thing with the pads, because when we go, we make we make sure all the women that we empower, we try and create a sustainable business cycle that it, as much as we've trained them in these skills, at least we make sure that they also have a, somewhere to start from. We even look for business for them so that they keep on working and they don't, they've not just gotten skills. So that picture was, was by a lady who, who is, is a young mother who had made all those bags and was showing them off and celebrating her and she was, able to buy her own machine, start her own workshop and makes all those other products by herself. And she, she was able to look after her kids and take them to school um, out of the, the situation she was coming from being a survivor of gender-based violence and staying being single with her three sons. So yeah, we're celebrating her in the picture. Oh, that's awesome and super cute too. Um, okay, thank you. And I just wanna follow up on one thing before we move on to Rema. Both Rema and Jamila are in the dark right now. They um, are because they, um, Jamila mentioned load shedding and that is a way of managing electricity, which in practice means you sometimes don't have electricity right when you want it. So we thank you for being here under these conditions and also recognize the importance of your solar backpack innovations, Jamila. Um, so thank you, Rema, um, or thank you, Jamila, and um, welcome, Rema, um, to please introduce us to your work. Um, I'm just going to pull up a beautiful picture here of some of the ladies you work with. Um, okay, and go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Deb, for having me. And it's always a great honor for me to talk to young people and uh, really to inspire them, to show them about what we do in Africa. And uh, really, so for me, uh, where do I start? My name is Rayma Kasule, and I'm the founder of CEDA International. And uh, CEDA International does uh, several programs, but I'm going to talk about only one program, which is uh, Plus Africa, Linky Beta. Uh, so Plus Africa, I I'll start from who I am. I was born a village girl in a small rural uh, village in Uganda. And that has shaped my trajectory. And so as a way of paying it forward, I started CEDA International. 
so that I also support other women because someone helped me and I'm also helping other women. So uh, Plus Africa, a link beta works with girls who are between 18 to 30 years. And so, like I said, link beta is a word I came up with. It means incubate, link and incubate ideas. So really what we do for our girls, the challenge we saw and what we are solving is our university girls who are our graduates can't even get a job paying more than $1.5 a day. And youth unemployment in Uganda, just for uh, as a data point, youth unemployment is at 46% in some of the areas. And for the young women that we work with, it's even worse. One, uh, they don't have the right skills to get into employment. Their social capital is so low, so they can't even uh, get someone. In Uganda, it's more of who you know and your networks. Uh, so they don't have that. And lastly, uh, in our culture, we come from strong cultures and religions where women don't have voices. So the women, the young women don't have any voice. And we said, no, we can't have the life we led be passed on to our girls. So for me, my passion is to break the intergenerational poverty that is going on in our communities. And we do that through education, labor mobility, and also engaging these young girls. So we do three things. We skill them, we link them in terms of employment or internship, and we also engage with government because we can talk about labor and education and uh, jobs if we don't deal with government. So we engage with government to create employment pathways for young girls, specifically young girls, because girls are really affected differently at the workplace than boys. For them, even getting through that door is really an issue. So we work with the private sector. Uh, they give us uh, a part employment. The young women who are working within the corporate companies are the mentors to our young girls. So we do the mentorship, we do the leadership development, and we also do business incubation. Because it's been said, and uh, the Global Monitoring Report says Uganda is one of the most enterprising countries in the world. However, businesses fail between one to two years. So we give them the skills so that they don't only start their own business, but they also sustain those businesses. Because more than ever, we know that uh, transformation will come from the young people and the girls are the leaders of that. So for us, giving them the skills they need, skills such as communication, confidence, self-esteem, analytical skills, uh, financial literacy. I can never ever emphasize that. Because when we give them financial literacy, they get economic independence, they get social stability, and they also gain the really agents to say, I'm going to be an active citizen. So that's what we do. And what we really aim to do is to build resilience of these young girls so that they don't only succeed, but they thrive. And most importantly, they pay it forward by supporting another girl or woman in their community. So, um, and by the way, I think of this a little bit, it's kind of related to, you know, American college students leave too, and, you know, sort of have trouble transitioning to the workforce. It's a different set of challenges and everything else, but we've got the, um, was it the Tuck business boot camp thing or whatever for, it's just three weeks. Like it's a less elaborate version. It's more focused on hard skills, how to read spreadsheets and stuff. Then it's got some soft skills stuff, but in some ways, I, I think of this a little bit as the kind of Ugandan version of that maybe that has more on the mentoring and networking front. Is that, is it kind of like that? Kind of like a business boot camp, but with a real emphasis on networking? Is that a fair characterization or no? Is yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, we actually do boot camps. And for us, the boot camps are important because these girls are giving them that exposure and bringing them together just brightens their day, uh, getting a supportive network, talking to other girls, uh, hearing from role models, uh, people who have really made it from your community, giving them really, uh, what would I call it, relevant examples of other women who have done it. 
uh, really boost their uh, confidence to also know that they can walk that journey. They can do it. And we've seen paradigm shifts that are happening uh, with the girls are starting a business from like almost $40 to now having a business which is almost 500,000. Okay, so, um, you know, this, this raises something interesting that I've learned from each of you in different ways. And that is, you know, different individual people, different women are wired for success in different kinds of ways, right? Like some are natural born entrepreneurs. We're talking to three of them here, right? Like Roman describes herself as a serial entrepreneur started, I don't think you mentioned this, like the first woman owned advertising agency in Uganda and like one of the biggest in the country, just full stop, sold it, went into social good. You've got two other entrepreneurs here and, and doers and changers, but not everybody's wired that way, right? Like some people are just, you know, would be happier joining an existing economic enterprise and contributing to it rather than leading it and so on and so forth. How do you account for that in your program? Some, some women don't want leadership, some, a few do, most don't. How, how do you kind of sort that out and make sure that the leadership oriented ones get support for that and the other ones find a place for that. I guess um, maybe I'll start with Antoinette on that one because I know you folks have built in some um, community supports for the, you, you don't just train women to become tailors or whatever you know different um, thing that they've chosen to work on. Um, you, you create cooperative groups, correct? Like cohorts for them to support each other. Can you help play that out a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Deb. Um, yeah, first of all, during the 12 months, there is a, a strong component of life skills, but also de decision making and uh, for women. And um, also, yeah, starting by several life skills, like value your work at home, how do you value it? How do you network with other women? How do you manage conflict and solve issues? Um, your health, to be a uh, health. So uh, that really build the confidence of the women, which is really an important part. So every woman needs really confidence to do even business because you have very strong one. Like uh, when we provide like a first mass stipend, second month, type in, the most entrepreneur women will start business before you end the program. You have like some of the women, the, the one you are talking about, have like free ideas, free businesses implemented. But some of them, of course, are slow. But I may say that the program is really very successful. Most, most of the women, like uh, we have 50% of them who declare that they have gone out and talk about the program and give ideas in, in their community meetings. So 50% is really a big number. But if you really go, that's my experience. I've seen that there are really like true leaders in those, like because we teach in, in class of 25, but you have like three, four come just out. And uh, the women are also able to, to perceive them and they really lead. However, we are really giving to each of the women the capacities and the same skills so that they can really uh, take the responsibility to talk, to voice their issues, to take decision at home about um, family planning, about uh, income, about uh, assets. So all of them are really voicing and, and they are really having um, uh, leadership skills. So it's also combined with uh, like advanced training for some of these who are leading their cooperative because inside the cooperative, after graduation, they continue to work into the cooperative. So the women learn from each other. They learn, they learn from each other how you take decision, how you deal with the bank. So slowly you get also a big number, but we provide also like specific training on leadership and storytelling, which also adds on those leaders to become even uh, stronger. As uh, you mentioned rightly, the center, uh, and that's one of the role of the Women Opportunity Center, which is a social enterprise created in 2013 uh, to support our work to advance and uh, provide an entrepreneur, like incubation center for women when they come find space, uh, find the community, discuss, but also do businesses. It's also it's also role. It's really to increase that uh, capacity and increase women leadership and give them space where they can develop. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And Jamila, um, I, I know that you in your work um, have thought about issues related to this and, and also knowing all of you have had to think in different ways about how to keep women who are trained in your programs from competing for one another. So you can't, I, it was very powerful when I was asking, okay, so did you pull all the women from this part of town that we're in? And you're like, no, I can't train 50 mechanics here or it'll just drive down prices and they won't be able to support themselves. So can you talk a little bit about that? And also this whole idea of like, how do you identify leaders versus like those who need to be part of a cooperative work experience? Um, so, you know, um, I, I told you the story of how I ended up starting the Girls with Tools program um, before actually when I even came to Dartmouth, I was doing something called the Gym Mobile Laundry Service and I was going around hiring girls, um, still young mothers and would do door-to-door -door laundry and yeah, after the, the, the business would still um, take them into entrepreneurial and employable skills training. But I was so bothered by after the training, the girls, the ladies would come out and do the same businesses. Um, they would either do market stalls, they would either do um, selling um, salooning. So when, because they were from the same area and they were coming from the same um, lifestyles, they would end up um, struggling for clients. So when such a lady who's getting out of sex work, who's very assured of, um, of a client and now is into salooning and is fighting for a client with a fellow lady, um, she's bound to give up. So that's how I actually thought of the Girls With Tools program. I was very bothered why when women in our area, when they think of starting a business, the, the first thing they actually think of um, is salooning what is ideal as a woman, what society thinks they should do as a woman. And the market already here for the male dominated careers was very empty and hungry for women to, <laughs> to take it up. So that's how I've made sure that um, they don't have to struggle for, for power amongst themselves and even fight for clients. And yeah, exactly what you've said. Um, I try to make sure and cluster them into um, different companies and each company, we, you, we already see the ladies, even with the culture, because we make sure even after we make sure that the, the ladies are saving. So in the saving spa already, you can see a leader comes out to, to trail her fellow team members to save. And she, she shows leadership acts of um, drilling her team members, let's save, let's go and invest. So among themselves, they immediately identify someone who is going to lead them. They, um, the others you could see are really not up for such a leadership role. So the different cultures that we create among the girls with tools already indirectly puts out and depicts the leaders that come out of them. So we make sure that the companies they create are supplied among the areas they're working to try and to try and leave that competition, but also the cultures that we, we bond between them um, throughout the training brings out the leaders. And of course, we beyond the hands-on training, we make sure they go through the leadership training, they go through life, um, life skill training so that they can understand the different capacities uh, encompassing doing business, but also understanding the, who they are when they get into those businesses. Can you clarify while, while we're talking about yours, um, what, what are the life skills training that you work in? What what topics do you cover? We heard some from Women for Women, you know, of the issues they're talking about. Is it is it a kind of a similar range of issues or different? I know they really same how um, the biggest is building, changing their mindset, um, building their confidence, understanding who they are. Um, I have a culture myself, whenever I, I wake up, I stand in the mirror and I tell myself I'm amazing. So I, I make the ladies practice that every day because these are girls who are survive, women who are, young women who are survivors of gender-based violence, um, the, the young mothers, the school dropouts. So society has perceived them as un, very van, vulnerable and unfortunate. So their self-esteem is quite low. So our biggest, biggest thing is to build their confidence and self-esteem, but also change their mindset around that they, 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 what, what they can do, what boys can do, actually they can do. It just, it's all in the head. 
Um, so we go through all the basics around how appreciating themselves, appreciating who they are, their etiquette in serving these jobs, um, anything to encompass with their lives, but most importantly, changing their mindset and confidence in believing that they can do the jobs that the, the men in their communities do. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm um, going to go to Rema, who I know also has actually talked to my classes through an affirmation process of, of her own when she's talked. It seems like that's a, a helpful thing. Is that part of your kind of soft skills training in your program? Or, you know, is that kind of thing part of it? And do you have to not do as much of the kind of life skills training on gender-based violence and, and um, basic empowerment issues because you're working with a college, uh, college graduate population? Uh, that's a very interesting question, uh, but, but uh, just for context, uh, uh, in Uganda, uh, even if uh, you've graduated from college, for example, uh, a 24 year old is not old. So, so you are not uh, independent in any way. So the impediments are the same, whether at a family level, at uh, your personal level, the confidence that uh, Jamila is talking about. So for us, what we do apart from the self-reaffirmation, uh, we have a model which is called the 5D cycle. And it starts from discovering who you are. Who are you as an individual? Because we strongly believe that if you don't know who you are, you never know what you want. And in self-discovery, that's where we do uh, passions. What are your passions? What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? What are the things you think you can do in life? And that's where we see that transformation start to happen. Where these girls and uh, who just thought, oh, I'm not a leader, I'm timid, I'm a victim. Um, this, they label themselves before even the communities label them. That's the process where you see them start to come out, you know, like to start to blossom because they know who they are. And we do the self reaffirmation. Who are you? I'm a star. Who am you? I'm a champion. Who am you? I'm a beautiful African woman. That's what I tell them. So they have to find their own. And once we reaffirm them, that's also the stage when we see those who really want to go into leadership. Uh, those who want to go into entrepreneurship because they know who they are. And so the second D is dreaming. So in that dreaming, that's where they go deep to say, no, for me, I want to become an employee. And this is the kind of company I would want to work with, or I want to become a banker, or I want to become this. But then also that's where the entrepreneurs come out and say, no, I really want to start a business. And the next D is don't just dream it you have to put it on in action. That's where they do goal setting and action plans to make sure that you don't just think about it. Because guess what? Even me, uh, people always told me I was a dreamer, but it's only when I knew that the weakest pain is stronger than the strongest mind that I started putting things down. I do a lot of journaling. I have ideas books. And those are the values and tools that we give to these young girls for them to know that you don't dream about something and get it. You have to actually, it's a process. You have to work for it. And the fourth D is de design, uh, after design develop, that's where they develop key character habits and skills and all the skills that uh, the ladies have talked about. Those are the skills that we give them. And the last D is destiny. But we ask the girls to think about the destiny now. So begin with the end in mind. So if you say you want to start a salon, a hair salon, what kind of salon, where will it be? Who is doing the similar jobs? That's where we also look for mentors, who is doing similar work that you can go and learn from, job shadow, do an internship. So really for us, uh, one thing I want to emphasize lastly, we demystify the word leadership. So we tell these young girls that leadership is not a position, it's not a title. It's what you decide to do with your life and take action and lead some people into what you want to do. So for every girl, you have to take up a leadership role, whether in your mentoring club or within your village or within your community. And we do competitions also where we ask them any kind of competition uh, to do poems, to do songs, we call it edutainment so that they learn as they do. 
And once they, you bring in competition and they feel they want to do that, they, you know, they, their creativity just comes up. But lastly, what we emphasize is collaboration. We tell them that you can't work alone. You need all the women around you. Know, your networks will create your net worth. Don't just produce something. If you have a hair salon, someone else is producing bags, why don't you collaborate so that the bags go in the salon and the salon, uh, the, the people who all buy the bags are, are referred to go to the salon. So really it's about collaboration and working together. And for us, what is so critical and what we tell these young women is that you can't walk alone. You need to take others so that we go together. And with that, you see them really transforming who they are, but also embracing relationships and also uh, embracing decision-making because they have to make decisions even at that young age. Fantastic, that's so helpful. And literally everything you said about sort of how to kind of identify with self-esteem and thinking about who you are applies to Dartmouth students. I've seen you allow those classes of students being like, oh right, I need to think about this too. It's, it's relevant to every young person in, in the world, really, and, and really worth thinking about. Think about what she said, folks, um, male and female and non-binary. Um, so we've got some great questions coming in, and one is so core to this. And um, it said, Babette asked, um, for Antoinette, can you talk a little bit more about the male engagement programs that you mentioned? What do those involve um, and are men typically um, receptive and responsive to the programs? I love that Bet's asking that because that's a big part of what I took away from visits to, to your organizations and also to Jamila's on the ground. Rema was at Harvard when I was in Uganda, so I can go visit her um, there. But, um, but um, that, that the role of men and how you work with men in the community to get buy-in for these programs and everything was so interesting to me. Antoinette, can you start by pulling that apart and then we'll move to Jamila and have her pull that apart for her program too? Thank you so much, Deb. Um, yeah, that's an important uh, uh, question and an interesting program that um, we have learned through the implementation and through the action that we have on the ground that uh, not involving men is really was an issue because um, you, when you develop a woman and leave the man and ignore the men, uh, the women were facing issues. Like even recently, we have issues where, for example, you were seeing those pictures of um, uh, women do, doing village saving and giving money around which they bank and then can learn from that money. You have seen also how we are digitalizing them. But we were seeing like, for example, a man coming when they're going to share their, their savings, come say, okay, you know, this is the money the woman put in here it's mine. I was giving this money to come to, to, to really save in this group. And sometimes really bring conflict. And we have one case when even the local officials thought that was really a, 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 an issue. But the, the, the other women stood up and said, no, this is really, it was really a GBV case, for example. So you could have such, such cases. Or when a woman uh, goes with her money, she has done her business, she has tried everything, but the man, the man wants to get this money to take beer, for example. So it was really, it can happen. So, but, uh, and then we started really involving men. So we need at the start of the program, we're going to our role, we're doing this outreach to the community to do selection. So we invite also the women at the beginning when we have the list of participants, to tell them, look, this is a program. We're going to have women attending classes on these days. You need to support them to come to, to the classes because some of the men, we also ask their wives, where are you going? Why, why are you leaving our home? So those are like issues of really not supporting the women, which could, for example, lead to a dismissal of a woman if she doesn't complete the program. So involving men is really important. So we talk about, the benefits of the program. It's a benefit for the family, if it is for the entire family. That's one way, inf informing them, informing the local leaders. But the, the, the other interesting program is that we are taking men, not for a long program, but we have special training, like a one-week training where we bring men 
uh, local leaders, but also some male family members of our participants. So we have uh, the program include um, gender equality, sexual and reproductive rights, uh, girls' education, uh, value of women work, so that they support and they change their masculinity into positive um, uh, behaviors. So it's very interesting. We currently have um, with the ICRW Center, the Research Center on Women, uh, to, to have a research project on how uh, what is the impact of involving uh, men and not involving men. It will, be, it's, it will be run for five years, but already we have good results. When men get involved, uh, you have very strong outcomes in terms of um, working together, saving more for the woman, but also assets, uh, quick assets, but also the, the climate at home really became um, uh, much, uh, they are becoming more supportive to the women who are taking role into the leadership position in their community. And we have very, very nice stories about the change. Uh, last week, we have celebration of legal, legal marriage for like 22 couples among that uh, research group. And this is an important part as well, because if an African woman is living illegally with uh, a man, they are really, the children are denied rights, but also they are also uh, violence at home. So like legalizing uh, also marriage here is very important for a woman. So uh, that's one of the, of the outcome of such kind of program, but there are so, so many benefits. So the work is big because uh, the patriarchy and also the, the perception and, and really negative perception on masculinity is, is really very common. So it's an important, uh, a topic, it's an important work to really increase as um, uh, means continue. Uh, we really trying to see how this can, can reach a, a big number. So uh, for this research group, we will even continue, like we have session for couples, not only men aside, we have session for men, session for women, and then we have session for couples where they come and discuss the issues and give uh, feedback, but also we follow up the families and the couples and the main behavior change. Very interesting. Um, and uh, before we turn to um, Jamila on this related question of involving men, you know, I wanna point out when, when Women to Women International comes in, they train a, about a hundred women at a time per cohort or village, correct? It's about, mm -hmm. and um, and it's a quite an organization. I mean, they've got tents set up, right? So these can be conducted in the rain. This was even pre-COVID and we'll get to that in a minute because we do have a question on that. Um, but, you know, they really have to get community buy-in for this. And it was actually the one that I went to was held out or, or one of the ones was on a on the town hall property, essentially. And so men really had to be brought into this process. And this is for a year, right? So it's a whole community process. And so they've learned over time, you know, how to build that in. And, um, and, and so Jamil, I know that you're very experienced with trying to pull men in both for your work with Girls for Tools probably. And I know for menstrual hygiene work, super important, always a big takeaway. Um, there, in addition to that, though, there was also a question from somebody saying, do you get a lot of pushback on the idea of women going into male professions? Um, and so if you could, could address that, that'd be great. And thanks for such great so, questions. Um, yeah, these are really good questions. Um, so when we started the Girls with Tools program, we started with um, around um, 30 girls, um, 30 young ladies for the Girls with Tools. And um, before we engaged the men, the attendance was um, um, 50, for actually 40%. And even after the grad ones who graduated, because we had 20, 25 girls graduate, and the ones who re remained in the business and actually still implementing around 10 ladies, but after we started engaging the men, um, the attendees of the young women um, shoot up to 85%. And also, because that was the next year, um, we had 60, 60 participants. And then after the graduating and retaining them in business also shoot up to 90%. So we noticed uh, this trend why when the girls, the ladies were coming to school, um, most of them, and the training center, most of them 
when would ask them why didn't you come yesterday why why didn't you attend and most their argument was their men their their husbands who are usually bought about their riders that is uh, motorcycle riders um are stopping them from coming for for skilling yeah and then those who had male guard, male guardians fathers would literally tell them that is so it is so immoral for you to take up these career sets. So going forward, we created something called the Good Men Project um, to try and in all our programs to engage the men, mostly the, the, this is the guardians of the, the young ladies, um, their husbands, their brothers, in the Girls With Tools, every, every week we have them come down to the center to appreciate what the ladies are learning and even learn with them and 50% um, of, our, of our facilitators are male and also women. And even going forward um, for this year, we decided as much as the program is called Girls With Tools, we train, we train girls, we train 95% of the ladies, we train 90% uh, uh, of the ladies, 90% are ladies. And we, we decided to also engage 5% um, the boys to join the program so that to, create, to have that inclusivity and for the male community to appreciate that the, what the boys can do, the girls can do. So going forward, when we started engaging them, both in the skilling and the hands-on skilling for them to talk to, with the ladies and appreciating them and changing their mindset that these women can actually do, do this. And that took away, when we started engaging them, it took away the biases. Um, because at first, when these ladies would go and look for internship, um, at, at for like let's say for garages or would go to electricity installation places and they were chased away by the men themselves so but when the community and the men were engaged in the whole training what they were going through um it took away that bias from them because now they, they, they were practicing with the ladies and they could see that what they were doing the ladies could actually do them so it helps so much to take away the bias and also with the bias we made sure to create all ladies workshops um, so that we could market them instead of letting the ladies go out and look for their own jobs so that when they see them in this particular workshop, serving, servicing center or mechanics workshop, seeing them working as a team, the community appreciates that they can actually do this. So we've taken steps engaging the men, but also launching all ladies workshops so that the community can appreciate and take away the bias that the women cannot do these things. For the smart bugs, um, for the menstrual health management, what we did, um, we make sure we have the boys and the fathers of the ladies, of the young girls in the trainings. Because before we give out the smart bags, we, we first take the girls through training on how to make their own reusable pads. And later we even teach them on how to make pouches if they need them. And then later we give them the bags. Because at first when we're testing the bag, we had an issue where the men in the family would go and sell those bags. So going forward, what we did, we made sure that they are part of the training to learn how to make the reusable pads and also to explain to them the importance of the girl having the bag. So they, they, they understand the value of why the girls are getting the bag and why the girls have to stay in school during their periods. To the extent we teach them the cycle. So we find when we are teaching the parents, when we're teaching these men, we find so many single fathers who appreciate, who have been dying um, and going through the taboo of talking to their daughters about uh, menstrual health management. And later on, the, we've gotten in, um, in Iganga, we got some men who grouped up and started a business of making visible pads that they would sell to their fellow women in the community. So it really became a plus that now if they've become our target market when we are going to the Eastern, they we send them to even do the training. So it makes more sense. And weirdly, women and young girls get more comfortable when they're hearing the training from men. I don't know what happens there. So it has pushed us, our program, even much further. So that's how, how we've engaged them. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to see one of their trainers who's a community health worker. I, I think there are two things about East Africa that, that everybody in the U.S. needs to understand better, and that is the power of those financial women's groups 
to, to loan money in a, in a very organized way. That's a very common and important dynamic for female empowerment in East Africa, especially I think rural female um, empowerment, um, but also that, that kind of dynamic um, of, of having community healthcare workers deliver some information. And I got to see just this super powerful, effective, funny, community health worker, which is a nurse essentially, um, give menstrual hygiene training to kids and boys and girls are listening and elders from the community were there. It was just so powerful to see the importance of both male and female training um, in, in that context. Um, so I wanna hit COVID in a minute. I'm gonna turn to Rema first on that, but first there was one small thing that uh, for women, for Women International that you're um, facing a new challenge. And I, I thought that the way you were handling it and thinking about it was so interesting and illustrates a lot. Um, a, a, an issue came up about smartphone use or phone usage and smartphone usage is becoming increasingly important to business, to conducting even the kind of small individual trades, um, tailoring or, or whatever, the, the variety of kinds of things that you're often working with. Um, and so, and women tend to have less access to phones um, in, in that region, um, which holds them back. And so you've been trying to figure out how to integrate phones into your program but I think you also tried giving out phones and found that they were getting broken. And so you were trying to figure out how to create empowerment and ownership. Can, do you mind talking about that just for a minute? I just thought it was so interesting how you had to kind of keep trying different ways to address that challenge. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Deb. Um, the importance of really uh, digital tools have really shown and was really obvious, especially during the the COVID period because we couldn't reach out to the women. And one of the way of supporting them, for example, was to, 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 to continue, Women for Women continue to provide the monthly stipend even when the women were not uh, really um, uh, being trained. So, and then we found out that women didn't have all phones and they were even lending the SIM cards and putting in like their husband or family members phones where we wanted to like transfer the stipend or communicate even to ask them, are you safe? So we continue during the, the really the, the, the confinement to call the women. So it, it is really very, very important. So we are putting at the center of uh, like each woman has at least save for a phone or we started distributing phones. So one of the thing we, we, we started also like uh, the, the before COVID, we had uh, the Dream Save app. It's an app, it's a startup, it's a US based, but they're actually here also. We started to, digi to, to, to put the app into a smartphone, give a smartphone to the women groups so that uh, they, they, they really like a woman can get like an SMS of, so it's really an easy way, it saves time, but it's also give trust and, and, and really increases the outcome in terms of how much the woman is saving. So it's very important. We are trying to increase that and to have more support to really digitize those uh, village saving, which I said are completely integrated into our program. So we think we will continue to really uh, make a progress and really, uh, get that done. So the, the fixing of the phone is one way because this applied to the phone, but also to other equipment. Women for Women do provide startups in terms of equipment, tailoring machine. You have seen like, um, we have also the, um, the, the knitting machines. So ownership, ownership is very important. Like for the phone actually now, we are not giving like one, uh, 100 for the cheapest smartphone, for example, which can take the application. We are ask, asking, for example, the women to pay a certain percentage. Like uh, I think for our new project, uh, we are requesting like for graduates, we are requesting 25%. But I think for, for one of the donors, it was uh, like a COVID response. But actually like contributing, it's really a lesson learned. Contributing and ownership, building ownership for everything, for the equipment, for the phone is very important because they know this is an asset that I contribute to saving for its reparation, for example, setting small amount of money into the savings on how they can replace that also uh, 
uh, provide sustainability of the program that we are doing. But it's really cross cutting everywhere into agri agriculture, into the other uh, program. It's very important that the people with we, we are helping, of course, they are vulnerable, but they taking the leadership is very important. And normally they have the solution also. So it's applied for the equipment, but also why, why we are trying also to give them solutions uh, to the problem that they have, we consult them because they have the solution. What they need is really the skills and the opportunities. So it's very important to integrate that into development. Solution, uh, community-based, getting their ideas, uh, hearing what we are thinking, but also contributing to what we are, to, we are doing. So it gives us also much, uh, a lot of success. I, I love that, the, that description because it shows the complexity of this and the, the essential import of local leaders. Like if this was people coming in from the outside and trying to do this, they wouldn't have known that the husbands are using the SIM cards. They would, nobody would have told them that. Like, and, and you know, they might, it, it would have been mismatched. Like it takes people who are language fluent and culturally fluent and, and talking to women in very real ways to be trusted and to, to learn this information. And then you've constantly got to try to stay ahead of the technology. So you, you have this system that's been developed over decades and yet mm -hmm. it's constantly having to adapt to these incentive mm -hmm. systems. I'm gonna point out one more thing before we go to, to COVID questions. Um, part of their model and i think jamila is too is is paying women a salary while they're doing the training program but then that's giving them a salary that allows them to participate in these loan programs and get used to that process to buy part of their phone so it's it's empower it allows it gets buy-in for men to allow them to participate because they're bringing home a paycheck it's just it's a really important piece of it and so powerful on, on all fronts. And that's something that not everybody would think about. They think, oh, we're going to provide training, but we're not going to pay people to participate in the program too. Yeah, that that helps to empower people. Um, so I want to ask COVID questions, right? Like I was there during the halcyon days of, you know, the beginning of 2020 before things got crazy. No masks, no social distancing, hugs from like a lot of these ladies because I was traveling with my daughter. So there was a lot of love being shared. Um, such kindness and such like closeness in these communities and to outsiders. Things have changed. Uh, and I know that, um, you know, the countries handled it very differently. Rwanda did a, a, you know, real shutdown that in my view, the US should have considered as well. Um, Uganda kind of went through a couple of phases of shutting down and then opening up and then I think kind of shutting down a little bit more. Um, how has COVID affected the work that you do and kind of what's your, what are your challenges right now in dealing with that? And let's start with Rama on that important question. And that's a question that's been coming up in the Q&A too, I'm seeing. Yeah, thank you, Deb. And uh, for me, uh, really COVID has brought the injustices to the front. And uh, I, I tell my people, people need to listen more. The fact that COVID is not affecting women the same as men. And whether we are talking about the women we support, uh, the women entrepreneurs that we, we've really supported to start their own businesses, they are doing like three jobs right now. They already have the burden at home, but now it's becoming harder because they have to make sure their businesses survive. They also have to look after their husbands who are home, most especially those who are in little tiny homes. I'm talking about a home which has two rooms, not two bedrooms, but two rooms. And you have to think about all the dynamics of with your husband every day in the same house, <laughs> day and night. And also supervising the children for those who have children. They have to supervise children to make sure they are reading or they are doing something. So really it has become very, very difficult. But for us, one of the things we did, uh, and uh, I'm glad we did that from the beginning and based on the information uh, that, that we got, I remember it was early March when, Harvard, when we closed and I called uh, my office in Uganda and told them what we need to do. And everyone thought, is she nuts? Uh, she's overthinking the future. And I told them, we are talking about the future of work, so we also need to reimagine our future so that we don't do everything as we did. And it's interesting what Antoinette is talking about. 
phone penetration with, with everyone has a phone. That's when we realized that not everyone has a phone, even among our people. So we had to devise means on how do we get, because most of our information is on the phone, you know, whether it's the videos, we have a, a platform where they, they share things on the, on the phone, are like updates and their goals is all shared on phone but because we are doing it in a physical office where there are computers we didn't realize that people didn't actually have phones that's number one secondly internet in this country is so expensive to have even if it's not wi-fi just a, a, a phone on your, a, i mean internet on your phone not everyone could afford it, not even at all. So that was a key other learning. But for us, what we did, we said, you know what, we need to turn this into an opportunity, not a stumbling block. And I, I told the girls, let's all start reimagining and think about things we, we want to do and things we can do. Today, the girls are doing from masks, they are doing sanitizers. They had to pivot their businesses to things which are going to really work. They had to pivot. Uh, some girls were not into anything to do with cooking. They are now cooking food because we realized we had a workshop where we said, what are those things that will be needed even during that lockdown? And we listed them and we asked them to reposition their businesses to suit that. So going back to the mindset and what we do for our work is this would have been a great opportunity for people to either give up, to say, hey, you see, it's happening to everyone. But we told our ladies, we can't go back 10 steps. We need to go forward. And the way we go forward is build our mindsets to know, you know what, things are going to shift. It's, going, it's not going to be the same, for example, for a long time. So we need to be the change that we want to see. So that mind shift alone for them was really, it sparked their innovation and their, now every day they are telling you about this, can we also do this, can we do? For us, what we did as an organization uh, using our networks is to connect them to our supply chains where those who did, were not in a certain market, we connected them to people so that, uh, for example, the Ministry of Health uh, wanted people who do masks, but these girls don't have that kind of information. So we got that information, gave it to them, connected them to the Ministry of Health so that they do masks for the country. So really for me, I come from a point where I'm creating pathways for people. And I tell them, I'm not creating employment for you. I'm creating pathways for you to travel and find your trajectory. And that's what we do and really, uh, it's an honor to, to do that every day to know that uh, I wake up to make a difference. But COVID-19 has really been, I won't say an equalizer, but in some ways it has brought up that where you either think I'm a victim or say, you know what, I can do it and I'm going to do it. And you actually go out and do it. So for us, for everything else, it's about action. Do you take action or do you sit back? Thank you. Well, on the taking action front, I know that Jamila and her partner, her partner Lucy Athiano from um, Ecopods in Uganda, also Dartmouth Yali, um, like we're making hand sanitizer and masks within weeks of of like sort of the 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 shutdowns and whatnot. It was sort of the speed was incredible. Um, but that's of course not the only way that um, COVID has affected your work. Um, what, what changes have there been? What are your big challenges now due to COVID and, and the environment? Um, and is, are there shutdowns right now in Uganda? Like what's the current state there? Um, the current state we are, uh... We're working really, but um, following SOPs and still our, our lockdowns increased to nine. Can't hear you. Okay, so we can't hear you, Jamila. Um, I'm gonna turn to Antoinette, or do we have you back, Jamila? Can we, Can you hear me? 
because you cut out there. Yes, I, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, those are some of the problems we are going through in Uganda. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, so we only have a few busy. more minutes. So, um, so just a okay. short version um, of the crisis and your handling of it, you know, in two minutes. Yeah. So I was, just, I was just going to give you a few statistics. You know, in Uganda, we have um, in total 25 million people and just um, 7 million can access smartphones. And those 7 million are people who are actually working here. Um, our program in Girls with Tools is basically hands-on skills. So when COVID hit, there's no way we could use technology to train the girls over social over technology using Zoom. It's very hard to train mechanics using Zoom. And also this year we had enrolled over 100 girls all over the country, but because of COVID, we can no longer enroll those so many um, because we're staying in hostel. First of all, because we don't have the funding also reduced because of COVID. And also the problems now, the problem that we're trying to solve before, um, gender-based violence has tripled, um, teenage pregnancies has tripled. So the numbers of the ladies who are helping before in all our programs have tripled and yet the funding has reduced. And the ladies who had also, um, who had graduated and started their business because of the long lockdown, most of them ha have ate out their capital. And now we are looking for money to try and get them a small startup, yet the funding has reduced. And like Rehma said, we also tried to diverse like the ladies in tailoring to try and making masks so that they can gain some income. And also now we've also changed our model. Instead of the training, 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 now we call the, we call the Girls With Tools a Girls With Tools Business Skilling Center so that all the programs have a sustainability where they're making work, they come to skill, to be skilled, but also doing business so that they have some little bit of money they're gaining and earning so that they can save it to start saving for their toolboxes. When we get funds, we also plan to give them startup toolboxes for all the companies that we've created. But we are trying our level best to, to intake more, smaller numbers, but still keep the, biz, uh, keep the skilling running. Um, that we don't kick it away while we wait for more funds and keep having the businesses kick off. And we've made sure we create a franchise of all the brands, the washing bays, the, the service centers, they are all branded in an equal way so that when a client comes to, to work on their car here at the Girls With Tools and there are some girls who have started up businesses somewhere else, they can easily give them business. Yeah, so there is, we make sure we work with the resources that we have right now um, that little equipment, but still keep on working to source for more resources. Yeah. You guys are such rock stars. I love you so much. Like, I'm like, you've got two minutes to describe the current crisis and your adaptation to it. And man, you hit that. You are <laughs> all awesome. I appreciate you so much. Um, Antoinette, I'm so glad we were able to get some sense from the cell phone example that you gave about COVID there, but I'll follow up with you so that I can at least share it with my students about how Women for Women is adapting to, to COVID in a bigger sense, because we are at the end of our time period here. Um, and we just appreciate your insight so much for the people that have been on the call. It's a great turnout. Um, but also the Dickey Center has been putting these kinds of talks online for continued learning after the fact. And mm -hmm. a lot of things around COVID have been hard. Um, and, and I hope everybody caught the fact that their, the need for their programs have increased while funding has decreased, right? Like that's a major challenge and nobody would wish that on any social good organization. That is a huge challenge being faced by social good organizations all around the world right now. But there are some things that have come out of COVID that have been positive. And one of those is the ability to bring you folks from across the world without flying you here through multiple time zones and 18 hour flights and all that. Um, and um, bringing you together, not just to talk about your programs in isolation, but um, with one another, and then to be able to share it after this particular hour and 15 minutes um, to educate our students and others who might be interested in these topics moving forward. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your friendship and your information and for the learning that I'm I just I'm trying to learn you've exposed so many other people to your learning and it continues and thank you for the important work that you do so thank you for being here thank you thank you so much thank, thank you, you everyone thank, thank you bye-bye folks thank you All for right. having us bye, -bye.